Okay, we've talked a little bit already about uh, yield surfaces. We've talked about the the von Mises yield surface. We've talked about now the Tresca yield surface. Uh, and those are the, I would say, even von Mises probably be the one we're going to focus on the most in this class. But I at least want to make you aware of uh, some other types of yield surfaces uh, just so that you'll uh, be familiar with, with them when you hear them uh, sort of mentioned in, in, uh, in passing in terms of research talks or if you read papers or anything like that. So let me begin by just saying that there's uh, the, the, that um, uh, for materials such as soils and rocks and concrete, um, uh, we, we typically want to have a yield stress or a yield criterion rather that is dependent on the mean stress. So if you remember both uh, both Tresca uh, as well as as um, von Mises only considered the the, the shear terms. Uh, you can imagine, though, if I want to talk about, let's say, plastic yielding uh, of, of maybe um, soil, for example, that the compression level of the soil is going to make a difference. And so we want some way to incorporate that. So let's just say then that for materials uh, uh, such as uh, soil, oops, that's such as soil, uh, rocks, maybe concrete. Uh, for th that class of materials, um, a yield criterion that depends on uh, mean stress also is also is more appropriate. So that depends on mean stress uh, in addition to J2, right, which doesn't have a mean stress dependence, uh, is appropriate. Okay? So here we're going to talk briefly about uh, three different common yield theories that, uh, or yield criterion rather, that, that account for this. So. We'll talk here about uh, three um, uh, common uh, yield criterion uh, that um, incorporate this. Okay, the most common and probably the first thing that most people will go to is something called the Moore-Coulomb criterion. Okay, the Moore Coulomb criterion. Okay, so the basis of this criterion is that uh, it's really a friction like term acting on a plane of maximum shear stress, and, and that um, it's either going to facilitate a, a normal uh, tension on the plane or a normal compression on that maximum shear plane. And if it's a tension, we're gonna th we think that's probably going to facilitate yielding. And if the if the sh that maximum shear plane is in compression, it's going to inhibit it, right? And that's not that hard to understand. If we think about the compaction of of soil, for example, the more compacted it is, the more difficult it's going to be to yield. Okay. So to think about how this develops, let's just say consider a stress. Um, in principle, stress space. Okay, so in principle, stress space. And we're going to orient the, the stresses here. So uh, principle stress space. And we'll say that sigma 1, the first principle stress, is going to be greater than or equal to sigma 2, which would be greater than or equal to sigma 3. Okay? In that case, we can say what the maximum shear stress is. Um, the max shear stress uh, in this condition is going to be given by uh, the following, right? So we could say that then tau max, right, it, it is going to be the largest. Remember, shear in any between any two principal stresses is just one half of the difference. So the largest difference is between sigma one and sigma three. So tau max is just going to be one half times the magnitude of the difference between sigma one and sigma three. Okay. Um, so in, if we if we thought about a Tresca criterion, so let, it would it, we could write it real really similar to this. 
So uh, a Tresca failure criterion. Um, right. Remember that Tresca is a is a max shear stress would be tau max minus some k1 critical value uh, is equal to zero. Right. That's or we would say equivalently that tau max is equal to k1. Right. Those are equivalent statements. Okay. So what's the what is the normal stress that's acting on the plane in which in which this um, uh, maximum shear stress exists? Well, let's let's just maybe draw so we can see what what this looks like. Let's draw a more circle. Okay. So here's my obviously my my principal stress axis and my shear. And if this is just, I can choose anything, but this is going to be sigma 3. And let's say that this is sigma 1, right? Then I might end up with, oh, that's a terrible more circle, but you get the idea. And we have a tau max, right? Which it also could be uh, there doesn't doesn't matter the sign is not matter here, so the tau max is equal to one half uh, times now sigma one minus sigma three, right? Um, what's the what's the mean stress? Well, if I come down and ask the mean stress on that plane, it's just the average of those, so that I could write that uh, sigma. And I'm going to write max for the that's the the normal stress on the maximum shear stress plane is going to be just one half times the sum sigma one plus sigma three. It's the average, right? So, so I want to incorporate that into a failure theory. So what I what I can do to to incorporate that so uh, to incorporate sigma max. Uh, Right. What what I can do is to say, well, I have tau max uh, equal to k1. Right. That's the stress. That would be the Tresca criterion. But I want this value to be reduced. Right. I want the the critical value that I have to achieve to be reduced whenever I have a tensile loading on that plane. So how about I say minus some co coefficient? We'll call it mu um, times sigma max. So a sigma max is positive, that's tension. Then I reduce the, the, the critical value that's required to cause yielding. If sigma max is negative, then I'm in compression and I actually add to it. So I'm going to now get a tension compression uh, asymmetry. Okay. And mu uh, in, this, in this problem is defined as, as what's called typically a friction coefficient. Okay. And it's a calibrated parameter um, in the sense of like a Coulomb friction model. Okay, um, but let me, what's the consequence of this? So here's, here's an important consequence. Um, depending on the, val the value of mu, so depending on mu, a failure now may not um, necessarily occur at the uh, maximum shear stress. So the failure may not necessarily occur on the plane of maximum shear stress. Right? And, and I'm not going to derive it, but it, I'll just say it can be shown that we can account for this uh, so it can be shown uh, that we can account for the, the fact that it's not always occurring on this plane. So we can account for this by setting um, mu, the coefficient of friction, uh, equal to an angle tan phi. Okay. Um, and then uh, phi, phi is actually a, also a, a parameter. Um, it's sort of defined as what's called an internal uh, friction angle. 
okay? And we can and then we basically modify this equation up here uh, with phi now. Modify the above uh, to get the following. Okay, so we, we end up now saying we still have tau max. Um, it's going to be equal to now a K1 times cosine phi um, minus uh, sigma, sigma max times sine phi. Okay, so what you can see from this equation is that um, when we have phi equals zero, uh, what that implies is that mu equals zero, and that gives us back the Tresca criterion. Okay, but this is this is what's commonly referred to as the uh, the the Moore Coulomb uh, failure criterion, and it's it's the kind of, sort of the simplest case that includes. Uh, the effects of uh, a, a normal stress or a, or a hydrostatic stress, particularly as it acts on the on the maximum shear stress plane. Okay, the next case, and the, I'm just going to really quickly go through the next one. The next case is what's called the Drucker uh, Prager criterion. Okay, and just like the the more coulomb theory was was sort of an extension of the tresca theory the drucker prager criterion is sort of an extension of the von mises um, failure theory um so i'll just say here um like more coulomb extended tresca uh the drucker prager Uh, extends the von Mises uh, to include a hydrostatic effects. Okay, um, and I'll just give you the yield function. Uh, in this case, uh, the yield function becomes something relatively straightforward right so we had uh, I'm gonna re I, we didn't exactly define the the von Mises in this way we had a squared term but uh, in this case so we had in, originally we had F is equal to J2 minus K naught squared uh, now I'm gonna uh, not take the squared components and I'm gonna say this is uh, plus uh, I1 over root 6 times mu, right? Another friction coefficient minus K0. So this quantity here uh, is the, uh, incorporates another Coulomb friction term into von Mises. Okay? One thing I'll say about this too is that if you think about why the extensions needed, more Coulomb only considered uh, effectively sigma one and sigma three, the maximum and the minimum, um, and said that there is no effect of this uh, sigma two, right, the, the second principal stress on the solution, uh, and that's ex that's actually what Tresca said as as well. In any for un under under any given load, whereas von Mises incorporates all of them. In the similar way, Drucker Prager represents the incorporation of all of the the principal stress components um, on failure, but then it still incorporates this Coulomb-like friction term, uh, as I've shown here. Okay, and then the final the final uh, criterion that's just worth noting is called uh, the Mises uh, Schleicher criterion. Okay, and uh, it's just another yield criterion that's try, trying to account for the fact that there seems to be a difference in yield strength in tension versus compression. So uh, it tries to um, considers uh, 
rather, uh, that the yield strength is different in tension and compression. Right? The other two uh, also tell us that, but not quite as explicitly. In this case, we would write the yield function as 3J2, so there's a, a J2 type plasticity, now plus sigma C minus sigma T times I1. I1, remember, is the trace. That's the hydrostatic component. Minus sigma T times sigma C. Okay? So let me, let me uh, label this for you. Sigma C is, um, is the yield strength in compression. Okay. And similarly, sigma T is the tensile yield strength. Okay. One feature that I want to point out about all these criteria, let me see if I can make sure this goes outside all of them. Note, all of these criteria, uh, they require uh, two uh, parameters to characterize them. So if you think about when we talked about Tresca, when we talked about von Mises, there was just a K0 or a K1 term that defined um, this critical value. But now for all of these criteria, we have a two parameter solution, right? One that's describing at least in the first two cases, in, in the case of Moore Coulomb and in the case of Druck, uh, Drucker Prager, in those two cases, uh, there's there's essentially a shear term, and then there's also a a um, how a, a, a coefficient for how the normal stress or the hydrostatic stress rather affects the the pure shear stress. In this case, it's in part C. It's a little different in that we have still two terms now there's a compressive yield strength and a tensile yield strength but they are still effectively requiring a two parameter fit to to um to develop the yield function so all of the criteria uh, for this class of materials this class of materials right requires two parameters as opposed to one, right? So for, for the one case, we had to find uh, K1 and mu uh, or phi, right? For the other, this was, this was more Coulomb. In the case of Drucker-Prager, we have to find K0 and then also mu. And then uh, in the case of uh, Mycie-Schleicher, we have sigma C and sigma T, right? So those are our two parameters that are required each time we, we want to use these criterion. I'm not going to talk any more about these. I just want you to be aware of them. And so that when you, when you come across them, uh, you at least know what uh, generally uh, they're trying to address.